discussion now is on, um, it's an exploration or a conversation on poetry and place. Um, and I just kind of, I wanted to open with a quotation from, uh, by Joseph Campbell, who at the end of his long life studying mythologies from around the world, uh, sat at, with Bill Moyers for an extensive interview. And that interview really put him on the map, but helped us basically understand human history through poetry. Um, and those poetry poems are our myths. Whatever culture we come from, we have myths with common threads running through them that, that unite us as human beings. So I, I just wanted to start um, with these lines from Campbell. He said, where we had thought to travel outwards, we travel to the center of ourselves. Myths were clues to our spiritual nature, and they could help guide us to a sacred place within where we could unlock our creativity. To see life as a poem and yourself participating in a poem is what myth does for you. Mm -hmm. And I want to cry every time I read that one. Mm -hmm. um, so then in the printed program, which is also available uh, online uh, on the library website and the links I've shared with, with many of you, um, I've identified the participants in this workshop by place. Our, we have state poet laureates, national poet laureates. Some towns don't have poet laureates, but they have incredible poets. Um, but the, we have honorary poets laureate. <laughs> you know? uh, so place is a geographical designation. And so my question is, is it more than that? What, what is place? How do we define place? How do you as writers and thinkers, does place come into play at all for you? I, I like to take the open approach and not, not go down the line and <laughs> jump in as you feel like it, Lynn. Oh, um, well, hi, Lynn, Lynn Northrop. When Sandy first asked me to be on this panel, at first I said, well, this is about poetry, and you know, you know, I wrote a novel, and how, why, so why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm used to being an outlier, but, you know, and I do write poems, but then my poems are all over the place. So, uh, so she said, well, Lynn, your whole book is about place. <laughs> so she flung to me here. So let me make a, a comment about that. I wrote a book called Leland, the Forest of Light, and it's based on Native American wisdom teaching. Mm -hmm. okay. So yes, place-wise, it all takes place <laughs> in the forest, OK? And it takes place with these their teachings that every animal has a message to teach. So just quickly, before I get to place, so if you are walking along in place in a field and a hawk flies very close to you, hawk means pay attention, life is sending you a message. Okay. Um, or if you feel like you really need to be in a quiet place, go to bear wisdom, they hibernate, and they tell you you need to go into the stillness. So. Yeah, the whole book is about a place of really what is our connection to nature, what is our relationship to nature. And so, yes, that is, I guess, obviously has influenced me. And, and it really starts asking a question. I wrote, do you mind if I read the preface? Of course. Um, so I, I started the book with a preface. Life is a circle. We all stand in the circle. We breathe together and live together. Our lives are one. When we love and take care of each other, we're in harmony with the earth. Be very quiet. Listen. Hear the wolf, the wind in the trees, the wings of the hawk, the humpback whale. Hear the rush of the river, the songs of the dolphins, the trumpeting elephants, the wild mustangs. The animals are our relations. The trees, flowers, oceans, and mountains are part of us, and we are part of them. They are calling to us. Hear their secrets. Feel their love. We are all one family in the circle of life. So yes, the book is all about, are we at a point on our planet where we need to redefine and reimagine 
what is our relationship to nature. And so, yes, the story is about that taking place in this woods, in this forest, with a young heroine representing the forerunners of uh, what I hope the uh, younger generation coming forward who are going to have to redefine mm -hmm. our human relationship. And so, yeah, the place in the woods is not so descriptive all the time of the trees. It's more how the trees talk to young Leela. And when she realizes she's in this place and doesn't realize, wait, I'm just getting used to talking animals, but talking trees, and as the tree says, but when you listen with your heart, we all speak the same language, mm -hmm. the trees, <laughs> the animals, and so forth. So in describing place, it's not as much descriptive as when she encounters mountain lion, one of her teachers, then you learn about how mountain lion sees place and what mountain lion has to teach her about leadership. Or when she um, meets up with Frisky Squirrel, who says he's a free spirit, he, you hear through the a squirrel's eyes, well, Leela, what, what are your gifts? What are you here to do? What's your purpose? Well, I haven't thought of my purpose. Well, every animal, tree, rock, and Flower knows their purpose. <laughs> he looks at her, you know, they offer their gifts and they're useful. So you have to learn your purpose and when you do, you will store it in your heart and use it when the time is right. So it is all about place, but often through the animal's eyes and the tree's eyes. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. That's, that's my... <laughs> that is... Tremendous, a sort of a universal, global sense of place. Would anybody like to add, add on or go from there, Pat? Yeah, I, um, I'm not a nature poet, so, but I really appreciate what you say. Um, when I think of place, I think of where we came from and, and the relationship between where we came from and where we are. Um, I think, I think where we came from influences who we are and what we write. And things may change and our poems may reflect the change, but uh, the, it, our environment still influences everything we do. Like characters in a novel, um, when I teach um, the fiction section of my course, you know, um, the, the environment, the setting is very important because the characters will act how they act and do what they do based on the setting that they're in. And I think the, the, the setting influences all of us. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to read a poem if you don't mind. Please do. That um, goes, goes back and it has to do with place. Um, and I think, you know, I write about people and I, I'm always influenced by where I came from and in how I think and how I treat people and what I do. And this poem is titled, Why Not Go Back? To the town with the factories, the old brick buildings that want to fall down, crush you again. Visit the ice cream parlor where the old man behind the counter stood and stared at your breasts as he handed you two scoops of vanilla. Watch them tear down the machine shop where your father worked the midnight shift, then stopped on his way home, Drago's Bakery, bringing hot bread for breakfast. Find the house you grew up in, the one with the broken fence, the one your friends were not allowed to visit, and your old elementary school, newly converted to apartments. The tree your father planted still stands in front by the flagpole facing the new highway. Remind yourself, there is nothing for you there. No one remembers your name. Your friends have all left. They live a good life somewhere else, and they never go back. If I could jump in after you, um, that was really, really powerful. Thank you. When I think of um, place, 
we were discussing at lunch the fact that I'm a military kid and moved around the country and overseas and so um, don't necessarily have what um, others might consider um, really strong roots. Um, so that's um, sad in some, I guess, ways in that, um, you know, I didn't grow up with the same kids and I don't have those same relationships. Although after hearing your poem, um, nobody's where they started out anyway. Um, so, but I, I think a lot about home and I think what home is, is wherever you feel you're most comfortable. And that becomes um, your, your place. And home can be even inside of you to where you take it with you when you go. I heard a poet say, um, say that once. But I think wherever we are shapes and defines us, even for that little bit of time that we're there. And if I look at my poetry, from when I started out, there are a lot of natural images, a lot of southern images, because I was living down south at that time. And, you know, my latest book, there's a lot of water images, um, because I don't live very far from the sound. And so that kind of um, imagery informs me. But I, I do think that place makes us, um, maybe sometimes undoes us, and it's very much a part of our poetry because it's very much part of who we are by virtue of being an American. And um, I have a very particular perspective. Um, and then by being a woman, and then by being a black woman in America, I have another type of pers uh, perspective because of my lived experience. So I think that having a whole panel about poetry in place makes sense because it shapes the poet and uh, subsequently shapes the poetry. You. You have a lot to say about place, don't you? I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I agree with very much and strongly agree with, with your perspective on place. Um, for me, place is always about landscape. It's always about where I am, whether that be urban or rural. Those are the things that show up in my landscape. If I had been near the water, I'd be writing about the water as well. You know, when I lived near the river, I wrote a lot about the river. Um, place also affects me in the fact that I have been displaced from my heritage. Um, I'm a first generation Cuban American. My father's from Cuba. He's exiled. I can't go back because of the exile. I mean, I, my whole recent book is about that. Um, it transverses many different terrains and landscapes because whether I'm in another country, those are the things that interest me. This is how I, you know, what fills in my poems, like the, the, the spirit of the place, the culture, the vegetation, the fauna. These are the things that my eye notices. I wouldn't consider myself a nature poet in that I'm writing idols or pastorals, but wherever I am, I take in the place that I am, and it takes even a sense just to give it location. Um, and I've come to accept that about my work because it's, it's this next, my next book, which is coming out next year, is all about the forest and living in the forest because I moved to the forest. And suddenly I'm communing with the trees, I believe you. Because I hear them, they're like, what is yes. And, uh, living there for seven years and the entire thing is about the last four years, it's called Whipsaw, the last four, you know, maybe ten years of living in America, uh, being a woman in Trump's America, and the subsequent, it's not over, so it's kind of an ambiguous ending, but watching my 
values and morals and my trees, you know, lose their protection, um, all of those things. So at first glance you might say, oh, she's a natural world poet, but then you'll read the poems and you'll say, oh, no, she's not. <laughs> but she uses a lot of where she is uh, to inform and give you a grounding of where, where I am in the world. Um, Chef's notes. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> uh, and also, I just actually finished uh, an essay on, on, on self-care for writers, right? Mm -hmm. And the entire essay talked about the place that I live and where I'm going and how it saved me as a writer, you know, being in um, a place where I could just walk the trails and watch how the forest replenishes and regrows and sustains itself and sustains the other trees still standing and the fungi and how much I learned about creativity just from being in that world. I had never lived in a, in a, in a, in a forest. You know, I'd always grown up in cities or towns or villages, and you know, essays are like reveal themselves to you. You don't even know where they're going, and you learn what you actually think by the time you're done with them. And it was kind of a revelation to me. You know, so I think place is pretty important. You know, um, and that's what it means to me. It informs all. It's like integral to all my work. Hi, I'm Jim Kelleher. I'm in a pretty good place. <laughs> um, it wasn't always so. Uh, I grew up in New York City, and it took me a long time before the noise settled down and I was able to hear myself. And I found myself in a wilderness at age 25 up on Cape Breton Island in Canada. And that was where my identity as a poet sort of crystallized out in the natural world, where the stars were close enough that you felt you might just touch up, touch them. And uh, at that point, I sort of tried to figure out what my place was in this world and how to be a poet in this world. Um, and that took me through construction sites, public schools, um, ultimately led me to an MFA degree and uh, several books. I wanted to mention Randy McQuilkin, mm -hmm. uh, who published my two of my, well, I self published about six books. I used to send books to people for Christmas. I gifted books to all my friends. I felt that I should be a poet for the community, mm -hmm. wherever that was. Maybe that was a construction site. They didn't have a clue where I was coming from, but that was okay. And uh, I found myself back on Cape Breton Island a few years ago, having pretty much lived my life. And again, I was in wilderness. I was in the interior. I was literally off the grid. You know, you like tracks of any kind. You could hear a moose, maybe, if that's what it was, what it was outside, or a bear and uh, writing by candlelight. Sandy asked us to bring a poem to sort of introduce ourselves. And I just thought to grab this poem, which was written up there, having lived my life and having relied upon some of the natural wonders that exist outside the city. And the title of this is, I Worry How I Appear Before God. Um, it's a short poem. I never worked or risked enough. Stubborn son of callous immigrants, contrite for lost years dreamed away, I stretched my youth in play. Old, I return your smooth sea stones, arching green pines, red sunsets, your iridescent purple hummingbirds, 
hooting owls, moose, mice, mist-rising on the Marguerite River, and your sun, luminous on clear ocean salt water. I return these wonders you let me see in the simple poems I write and say. So I think places wherever you are, you know, we say to each other, uh, where are you at? You know, um, places in inner space as well as uh, outer space. You know? yes. I'm happy to be here with all of you and to be in a good place. <laughs> I just remember my really terrible marriage. You know, we we spent so many hours together today. It's like, oh, we know each other. But we had some newer arrivals. We had Tom Nicotera, Peggy Diche, Pat Matola, Lynn Northrup. I knew that last So <laughs> 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 Jack Fishborn, Antoinette Burn Bell, Jim Kelleher. Um, and I did ask you guys if you would bring a poem to introduce yourselves do you can we just sort of rewind the table a little bit and maybe put those poems in the in the in the in the space mm -hmm. and so we so Suzanne and Antoinette if you want to read us a poem and then we'll move to, to Peggy and Tom on, on the space question the place space question uh, I book Fix Star uh, came out last September. So it hasn't even been a year yet. It um, is a book that transfer that is like a book of it's like a my quest to find my identity and my heritage that is my race. My father was a captain in the Cuban Revolution, and so we didn't really talk about Cuba a lot in my home because it would upset him desperately. Um, he came to the United States. He met my mother while he was transporting Armstrong Castro. And, you know, after after the revolution and immediately, you know, Castro started killing all the revolutionaries against the firing squads and all this stuff. So they left. You know, he took the plane and left. He was lucky he could leave. Um, but even though the Spanish was my first language, once I started school, like you know, they said no more English at home. So a lot of it was a race. So I had to do a lot of research, and that ultimately became this book. It has um, landscapes from Cuba and Spain and Miami and even Pennsylvania. Um, while much of the book is about that, it's also about longing and desire. Um, and I'm going to read one of those poems for you. And, this poem was written when I was born in Hialeah, Florida. We moved to Pennsylvania when I was five. And this is me and my husband going to Miami for the first time since I had left. Uh, we're staying at the Biltmore Hotel. And it's called Cool. I was also doing the research for this book, but I was mostly drinking. <laughs> 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 So cool. Desire, your name is Miami. Stirred with a sniff of sugar cane, crushed mint, Bacardi, and sunning yourself by the Biltmore pool. No, Miami, I sip mojitos while I am struck by the eyes of the cabana boy. He is heady with a cocktail of bikini and tropical oil. You know how when you go to Little Italy, it's all Chinese now? That's how Little Havana is, but with South Americans. We decided to skip it and drink mojitos by the side of the pool. Cubans, they're everywhere, says the concierge with a Cuban wave of his hand. Maybe you'll see some signs with Spanish writing. We drank mojitos by the side of the pool while I was desired and realized I don't desire you, Miami. Miami, you are not what I recall. Yet only within you do I feel desire. Yeah, um, I don't think he's a little bit. Yeah. 
school sounds good. <laughs> um, yeah. um, this one is called This Female Body. And what, how it came about is a dear friend of mine, Georgia, called me up one day and said, I have a perfect um, poetry prompt for you. And we do this to each other all the time, so I thought nothing of it. And she said, um, I want you to write, your, write a love poem to yourself. And I have to admit that I was confused um, and uncomfortable. And even to the point of starting to tear up. And, you know, I had to ask myself, well, why do you feel this way? And I think a lot of us women are taught to be self-deprecating and to um, always think of everyone other than ourselves. And so I went ahead and um, took up this challenge. And it's a challenge I like to give to other women. Um, and I think men can do it too to write um, a love poem to yourself. This one is called This Female Body after Margaret Atwood. If you look up her poem, you find it is satirical and self-deprecating, and I wanted to spin on that too. So this is from a totally different perspective. One, from a primordial pool of sleep, she rises into mourning finds her footing on wooden floors that remember epochs and grain and rings. She is sweet sandalwood, sleep musk in dreams trailing. Her lips suck mango cubes into smooth sustenance. Her nostrils invite wisps of coffee into her waking mind. Bathed in steaming water, soothed in oil, she will wrap herself in prayer laughter and balm, she will stroll the sidewalk, smiling. Two, without crinoline or costume, her body is tacit art. When she is timid, her locks become veiled. When she is worried, her hands clasp each other, holding her hope tight between them. Her lips curve into welcome, spread into joy. The breadth of her arms, the length of her legs, are Amazon authority and refreshing river spray. Her moods are lunar phases, dark moon meditating, wisdom waxing, anger waning. Three, once teeming with life, her womb was a taut bulge, weighted with joy and blessed by the kick and spin of future generations. She was breath and bread, blood and buoyancy. Her womb is quiet now in delicate ruin. Mm -hmm. Four, she cans the fruit of her own labor, lays brick upon brick, weaves what was threadbare into, warm, uh, into warmth. She says, we are safe now. Five, Stepping stone, cornerstone, load-bearing wall, rose blossom, trellis, ancestral hall, capitalist, socialist, temple guard, magistrate, potentate, marshalling yard, anaphora, tonka, triolet, villanelle, shattered sonnet. Six, give all, surrender, patient, kind, protect, hope, Persevere, put away childish things. Seven, this female brain is always searching for lost change, buttons, matching socks, the right words to say. This female brain is always keeping time. In the fabric of space, she weaves dreams into lullabies. This female brain is always measuring his thigh with her thigh, the length of his shin with her cupped soul. She is listening to him, listening to herself talking to him, but she is the music, a swelling aria, filling the sanctuary, drifting up to the rafters. I love the idea of womb out of place. Uh, as you 
yourself and for others. It's really beautiful. And ultimately, the sanctuary. Another afterglow of a poem. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I kind of use poetry as a way to make sense of different places. I, I love to travel and like that. I consider myself more of a, of, of a person, a people poet, than a nature poet. Um, but one of the great things about moving to Vernon um, when I was with child um, was knowing that we we're moving to a place that was full of trails and woods and farms nearby, but also gritty downtown. It had, it had everything, it had diversity, it had good schools, it's, and I still love the place. And you, you put in um, a little prompt about being laureate. Um, so I, I'd like to like, brag on Vernon a little bit, and it's got people and place in it. <laughs> um, so I did do sort of some, as Barb was saying earlier, occasion pieces during COVID because I, I think like many of us who were laureates during COVID felt a responsibility of, of getting the history right. And as Antoinette was saying before about there's the historians, but then there's the emotional history of what was going on. So <clears throat> I'd like to read a poem called December in the Year of Eruption. Now it's um, the word eruption means an uncharacteristic um, migration of a, a species that's never been to this place before, but it's been forced by climate change or some other kind of environmental problem to search for sustenance someplace else. And I just came upon that word when I was looking through our, our town's websites of trails and stuff, and, and one of the specialists said, we have an eruption, we have an eruption. It, it, Spelled I-R. Right? I-R, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I think of, you know, the, the root of eruption, breakage, and then, explosions and, and just dis discord and all of that was going on in 2020. And I dedicated it to Sherry Wood, um, one of my friends with whom I used to hike, I still do hike, in uh, this building preserve in, um, in Vernon. She was a manager at a nursing home in, in 2020 and got a horrible case and was hospitalized and almost didn't make it and they said her her lungs were, looked like fiberglass, so dense that they missed that three tumors were growing there, and they didn't discover that. So she's, uh, she's been hanging in there with stage four cancer. But, um, so this is for her. Um, December in the year of eruption. Hiking in the building forest, I'm felled by the sight of trees crisscrossed on the forest floor as if gods had forgotten their pickup sticks. Oh. Trucks hauled away other trees to where canopy gone, the onslaught of air is unbearable. The state prescribed the cuts to thin mature oaks and destroy invasive spruce, to make room for native seedlings and pitch pine, to loosen the earth for worms and bugs, to woo back warblers, towhees, Baltimore Orioles, but I see nothing new, only the dying and the dead. Yet deeper in the woods smells evergreen my nose, burbles of waterfalls tether my terrier and she greedily drinks. Trails diverge, flickers invite me up the beaten path where boughs of ribbons dangle ornaments. Shining spheres without spikes, glittery spirals twirling in a space of positive pressure. The corridor of green has ladders of light. My eyes climb to a rare red crossbill, inviting an eruption of migrants, calling, come, come, here, 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 come, come, here, here, here is enough for the long, dark winter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the woods are a place of sustenance, as you were saying, Linda, and they sustain the people and they sustain the wildlife and, and sustain us. Yes, yeah, and, and they need to be sustained and looked after well enough, even though the, the sight of the fallen, like the dead of COVID, um, you know, Darwin would say, well, the, the weak will fall and, and the strong will rise, but we also know that a lot of innocents um, were lost in the pandemic. And, um, and my friend Sherry, the, the casualty of that as well. Um, so, yeah, that's, 
poetry, it was a way to make sense of what all of that was going on. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think you're mm -hmm. I remember watching Lynn Manuel Miranda doing something inspirational during COVID from an apartment in New York. And I thought, he's in that little room. And, and that you could see reflections of walls across the street. And mm -hmm. living in this town and just being able to go out the door. And, you know, neighbors were weird. Because remember that phase where it was we all gave off, like, COVID when we walked? There was a trail of <laughs> toxic, you know. He's running out there. <laughs> Stop dropping mold on the road. Get away from the guy, you know. But there, there was that irrational sense of being invaded, and our yeah. sense of place was really disrupted. And that, that, and then I think space, be, place became space as we found ourselves online, holding on for dear life to relationships through Zoom and Google Meet and whatever we could find. So it, it's. Really, really quick for thought. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. And I felt like grabbing one of those instruments and playing it along with what you were reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, Tom? You going to bring it home for us? Yeah. Um, and going along with what Lynn said and uh, Suzanne and, and to actually with everybody, but a lot of, there's a lot of all the poems, some nature imagery. And nature is very important to me. Um, but so is place. And uh, I grew up in a rural area in Connecticut, Terryville. Well, my parents were factory workers. And then I moved, uh, lived in Washington, D.C., uh, downtown for a while in Baltimore. When I moved back to Connecticut, I was, it felt so good to be amongst all these forested areas again. And I took to hiking a lot of the trails, a lot of the long trails. And I have a whole series of poems called the Backpack Poems that I wrote on the trail. And, um, but I also realized that I kind of, when I, whatever place I'm in, I absorb that. I write poems about it. So I have poems about, that I wrote in bars, <laughs> in restaurants, on placemats, uh, poems uh, sitting waiting for takeout food. Um, mm -hmm poems that I've written at bus stops, uh, and I just, what I found is that whatever is out there outside of me becomes inside of me, and there's a merging between what's inside of you and what's outside of you, and for me that's the place where a poem comes from. Um, I'm going to read this, uh, my book, What Better Place to Be Than Here, uh, and the title poem is at the end. Um, it's the epilogue poem. It's very short. What better place to be than here? The fly buzzing me, the ant on stone, and how softly through the trees the wind whispers its poems. And I am in white and not in white, depending on how the branches are blown. Mm -hmm. As I was going through my book, I realized how many poems there were that had place as a beginning point. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, at the uh, at the sports bar, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, fishing my father at West Hill Pond. Um, all these different, you know, at the factory. I worked in a factory too for a while. All these these poems just came out of my life experience. But the important thing is, what's inside of me meets what's outside of me, and that's where the poem starts. That's you know, while everybody was speaking, I did I made a note that place seems to be the the environment we hear speaking to us. Which um, yeah. just seems to be what, and it's. Emotional, it's physical, it's psychological, and um, I was also just very aware. And I just for the folks who haven't been here all day, it's just very interesting that um, the calm in the room right now. The, to see how the energy has has assumed the shape of this place, you know. And um, and I'm just having some random thoughts about um, Woodbury's place in the history of art. 
in, in Connecticut, lots and lots of artists left New York to do their art here. And that is a weekend thing, but it's a place to, to be with a family and to find that quiet where they could take all those things that they experienced and knew from their, their city life. You know, um, Roy Anderson comes to mind, of yeah, course, of course, right? Yeah. Just down the road and around the corner, he was writing Slay Right in the Heat Wave. <laughs> true, yeah. true story, and the lyrics came later from somebody else, but that art came out of his life, his lived life that he brought here. And um, I, think, I think your poem is a really lovely place to, to let it sit. You know, I think it just, I'm just incredibly grateful to all of you, and it's sort of the, the afterglow of the poems, and all of them today have been really a rich experience. And,